Hi students, today we are going to learn about chemical reactions and chemical equations. Do you know all the chemicals in the world you know can actually be represented by a chemical symbol? We would already learnt about that in earlier classes. Now you know we can represent every chemical reaction that takes place around us by means of a chemical equation. How do you write these chemical equations? How do you exactly depict what is happening when say sodium is added to hydrochloric acid? And what exactly is a chemical reaction in the first place? We learn about all this and more in this chapter. All these complicated equations will suddenly start making sense after we've finished with this chapter. So let's proceed and learn more about chemical reactions first. What on earth are chemical reactions? Before we learn exactly what a chemical reaction is, let's look at some common examples of chemical reactions all around us. You must have seen nails like this, isn't it? And you must also have seen, you know that after some time, nails rust and become like this. Rusting of iron is a chemical reaction. Of course, every day we cook food in our houses. We have vegetables like this. And then when we heat those vegetables, food like this develops, isn't it? Hmm, that's tasty. So as you can see, Cooking of food is a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions are definitely all around us. Formation of curd from milk is a chemical reaction. Even the digestion of food inside our body is a chemical reaction. And what is more, ripening of fruits is a chemical reaction. This green banana becomes a yellow banana after a chemical reaction. Burning of fuels like wood is a chemical reaction. Even burning of wax or the fermentation of grapes, you know, the preparation of alcohol from grapes, even that's a chemical reaction. So as you can see, chemical reactions are very, very common. What exactly is a chemical reaction? Chemical reactions are processes in which new substances with new properties are formed. So basically, you know, when you have two or three substances and when they combine together to form completely different substances, that's when you say that a chemical reaction has taken place. In a chemical reaction, the bonds between the different atoms are rearranged. So as you can see, you know, let's say there are two molecules, this green molecule and this, you know, red and silver molecule. Now, after the chemical reaction, the bonds between these molecules will get rearranged and as you can see, you know the silver molecules or the silver atoms are now not attached to the red atoms. The green atoms are attached to the red atom, isn't it? So the bonds between the atoms get rearranged in a chemical reaction. Note that atoms themselves do not change. For example, if water gives hydrogen and oxygen, in that case, you know, the hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms in water are still the same as the hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms in the final products. But the bonds between hydrogen and oxygen break down and get rearranged to form separate hydrogen molecules and separate oxygen molecules. Understood? To further get a grasp of chemical reactions, let's take a look at two chemical reactions in the top coaching laboratory. One common chemical reaction that we use in our laboratory is the burning of magnesium to form magnesium oxide. So you know when I heat this vessel and when I add a magnesium ribbon, after some time the magnesium burns to form magnesium oxide. As you can see, the magnesium ribbon is burning here to form magnesium oxide. Magnesium plus oxygen gives white magnesium oxide. Another common reaction is the reaction between zinc and sulfuric acid. When you have sulfuric acid and when you add zinc to sulfuric acid, hydrogen gas gets evolved. As you can see, the bubbles of hydrogen are getting evolved here because sulfuric acid plus zinc gives hydrogen plus zinc sulfate. So again, this is an interesting chemical reaction. As you can see in both these cases, in the case of burning of magnesium and in the case of evolution of gas of zinc with sulfuric acid, you know, there are two substances and these two substances are reacting to form a completely new substance. Understood? Here are the hydrogen bubbles. So as you just saw, a chemical reaction simply represents, you know, the combination of two or more substances to produce absolutely new substances after the reaction. Understood? 
Now there are some characteristics of chemical reaction. You know, if something is happening, if some change is taking place, if a reaction is occurring, how can you make out that it's a chemical reaction? Like how will you understand that yes, this is a chemical reaction? So generally we have certain characteristics to identify chemical reactions. Evolution of a gas tells us that a chemical reaction is taking place. Sometimes formation of a precipitate, a special substance called a precipitate tells us that a chemical reaction is taking place. Sometimes the color of the substance changes and then you understand that a chemical reaction is taking place. Sometimes you know the substance that you are considering gets heated up or it becomes colder and then you realize that a chemical reaction has occurred. Sometimes a change in state occurs, a solid may actually become a gas and that is what tells you that a chemical reaction has taken place. We just saw for example that you know when zinc reacts with sulfuric acid, hydrogen gas is evolved. So that's a chemical reaction. Similarly, formation of a precipitate tells us that a chemical reaction is occurring. A precipitate is a solid which comes out of the solution as the reaction occurs. So you know if you have a solution and a chemical reaction is occurring, suddenly you might see some colored precipitate coming out of the solution or you might even see some white granules coming out of the solution and that indicates a chemical reaction. For instance, when you make potassium iodide and lead nitrate react, yellow precipitates of lead iodide are formed. Understood? So in this figure, we took a solution of potassium iodide and mixed it with a solution of lead nitrate. Then yellow precipitates exactly like the ones you're seeing were formed. So that told us that the chemical reaction between potassium iodide and lead nitrate had occurred. Similarly, as I just told you some time before, you come to know about some chemical reactions because of a change in color. So for example, if you take, you know, potassium permanganate, which is pinkish purple in color. And then if you acidify it by adding H2SO4, in that case, when you add zinc to potassium permanganate, the solution changes color, you know, like this, the solution turns gray from pink. As you can see, that's because of a chemical reaction taking place. So in many cases, you know, a chemical reaction takes place and you get to know about it because of a change in color in the substance that you're using as a reactant. So this is again one important characteristic of many chemical reactions. Many chemical reactions are also signaled by a change in temperature. You see, whenever two substances react to form a third substance, they either absorb heat or give away heat. Isn't it? If they absorb heat, in that case, the temperature of the final substance form decreases. If they give away heat, then the temperature of the final substance form increases. You see this picture on your screen? This picture shows what happens when calcium oxide or quicklime reacts with water. As you can see, it gives away heat. And you know, calcium hydroxide, the final substance formed, is definitely much hotter than the initial calcium oxide used. As you can see, these bubbles are present here because of the heat generated. Understood? So many chemical reactions are signaled by a change in temperature also. In many cases, chemical reactions are also accompanied by a change in state. For example, let's take the burning of coal. Coal is a solid, isn't it? But when I heat this coal solid, what do I see? Carbon dioxide is produced and carbon dioxide is a gas. So basically a solid is burning or undergoing a chemical reaction and a gas is produced. So you know when changes in state occur, that too is a characteristic of a chemical reaction. So these were the characteristics of a chemical reaction that we just studied. So up till now, you know, we discussed in detail what exactly chemical reactions are and we discussed a lot of examples of chemical reactions. We also studied what the characteristics of chemical reactions in general are. Change of state, change in temperature, evolution of a gas and so on. Now let us try to depict chemical reactions by use of chemical equations. That's the second part of our chapter. You see, chemical equations involve representing a chemical reaction using symbols and formulae. Understood? So for example, consider this reaction. Zinc plus sulfuric acid gives zinc sulfate plus hydrogen. So as you can see, 
you know instead of writing long sentences to depict a chemical reaction we use symbols like this like this arrow symbol here and like this plus symbol here to depict chemical reactions so you know instead of writing zinc reacts with sulfuric acid to give zinc sulfate and hydrogen i have said zinc plus sulfuric acid gives zinc sulfate plus hydrogen this is zinc here this is a bottle of sulfuric acid this is white colored zinc sulfate and of course this is hydrogen gas stored in the cylinder the substances which actually react to form the final products are called reactants and the substances which are finally formed after the reactants have reacted are called the products so in this reaction zinc and sulfuric acid are the reactants and zinc sulfate and hydrogen are the products an arrow like this always separates the reactants and the products in a chemical equation now this kind of equation that we have written here is a word equation isn't it because every substance has been denoted by a word zinc z i n c zinc then plus sulfuric acid gives zinc sulfate and hydrogen the actual true way of however denoting a chemical equation is by using symbols for each of the substances in the chemical reaction now you see the chemical symbol for zinc is zn that of sulfuric acid is h2so4 that of zinc sulfate is znso4 and that of hydrogen is h2 so if we replace you know all the substances with their chemical symbols and then if we use plus symbols and the arrow symbol then we get a chemical equation so if you have to write a chemical equation for the reaction between zinc and sulfuric acid you will say that zn plus h2so4 gives znso4 plus h2 so this is a chemical equation and you must remember you know how we wrote down this chemical equation we simply wrote down the symbols for each reactant and each product and then we you know use the plus signs and the arrow sign to write down the chemical equation here here's another reaction hydrogen plus oxygen gives water this is a word equation representing the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to give water now hydrogen can be replaced by h2 its chemical symbol oxygen is o2 and water is h2o so we can say that h2 plus o2 gives h2o this is the chemical equation representing the combination of hydrogen and oxygen to give water so that is how in general we write chemical equations understood there is however a small problem in writing chemical equations this way that problem is what we'll discuss next this problem relates to the balancing of chemical equations you see according to the principle of conservation of mass the net mass of you know the reactants must be equal to the net mass of the products isn't it after all the net mass of all the substances initially must be the same as the net mass finally and therefore a balanced chemical equation has equal atoms of each element on both sides you see after all what is happening in a chemical reaction there are a lot of atoms and these atoms are reacting amongst themselves you know to form the products if the net number of atoms initially is the same as the net number of atoms finally then the reaction is balanced or the mass conservation principle holds isn't it similarly we had just discussed you know that one atom doesn't change different bonds between the atoms change in a chemical reaction so you know if there are 10 hydrogen atoms initially there will be 10 hydrogen atoms finally and so you can say that the net atoms of each element are constant on the left hand side and on the right hand side and that is what balancing of chemical equations involves consider this reaction here h2 plus o2 gives h2o as you can see hydrogen has been replaced by its symbol h2 oxygen by its symbol o2 and h2 is the symbol for water now is this equation balanced a balanced chemical equation as i just told you is an equation in which the atoms of each element on both sides are the same so in the reactant side and on the product side the atoms of each element are one and the same and because the atoms are the same the net mass is conserved on both the sides so now let's actually see the reactant atoms and product atoms for each element 
hydrogen has two atoms on the left, isn't it? H2. Hydrogen also has two atoms on the right, 2H. Oxygen, however, has two atoms on the left, but only one atom on the right. How can this happen, isn't it? After all, the net mass on the left is not the same as the net mass on the right. And therefore, this reaction is unbalanced. We have to do something else to balance this equation. Let's now look at another equation. Say this one. Zinc reacts with sulfuric acid to give zinc sulfate and hydrogen. Now, is this reaction balanced? We'll have to draw a table to find out. As you see, Zn has one atom on the left and one atom on the right here. H has two atoms on the left and two atoms on the right. Sulfur S has one atom on the left and one atom on the right. And oxygen O has four atoms on the left and four atoms on the right. And so all the atoms of each element are the same on the left hand side and the right hand side. And therefore this reaction is balanced. So you don't have to do anything else, you know, to correct this reaction. It's already perfect. So there we go. That's the portion about balancing reactions. How do we balance a chemical reaction if it's unbalanced? We just saw that equation, right? H2 plus O2 gives H2O. We saw that it was unbalanced, isn't it? But how do we balance such equations? To balance equations, we have a step-by-step -step method. We follow step 1 and then we follow step 2 to balance an equation. The first thing we do is that we balance the atoms of the element with the maximum atoms first. The second step involves multiplying each reactant or product by a number to balance the other atoms. Now of course, at first glance all this must be seeming really weird. Let's actually consider a real equation and then see how we can balance it. Look at this equation here. Na plus H2O gives NaOH plus H2. Sodium plus water gives sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen. Is this reaction balanced? Now to check whether this equation is balanced or not, let us make a list of the number of atoms of each of the elements here on the left hand side and on the right hand side. If you consider the reactant atoms, there is one sodium atom on the left and one sodium atom on the right. Similarly, there are two hydrogen atoms on the left but three hydrogen atoms on the right. There is one oxygen atom on the left and one on the right. As you can see, the hydrogen atoms are unbalanced on both the sides and that means this reaction as a whole is unbalanced. Now, since only one atom hydrogen is unbalanced, we can start with step 1. We can balance the number of hydrogen atoms. Now, how do we balance the number of hydrogen atoms in this case? We can do that by multiplying the H2O here by 2 and multiplying NOH here by 2. If we do that, we'll have 4 hydrogen atoms on the right and 4 hydrogen atoms on the left, isn't it? What this basically means is that in this reaction, instead of one molecule of H2O reacting with a molecule of Na, we are now reacting two molecules of H2O with Na to form two molecules of NaOH. Understood? So we balanced hydrogen by multiplying H2O by 2 on the left and NaOH by 2 on the right, isn't it? Now, if you look carefully, you will see that hydrogen is balanced. However, Na is not balanced, sodium is not balanced, oxygen is still balanced, isn't it? You see two oxygen on the left and two oxygen on the right. But there are two Na on the right and only one Na on the left. So to balance sodium, we multiply Na on the left by two, like this. Thus, sodium is balanced because there are two sodium atoms on the left and right. Hydrogen is balanced because there are four hydrogen atoms on the left and right and oxygen is balanced because there are two oxygen atoms on the left and two on the right. So here we go. Two reactant atoms, two product atoms for sodium, four and four for hydrogen and two and two for oxygen. And so now this reaction is balanced. All this may sound a bit confusing initially, but as we go on balancing different equations, it will become a cakewalk. Let's balance yet another equation. Have a look at this one. Al plus O2 gives Al2O3. So is this reaction balanced? 
Again, let's draw a table. You see the number of aluminium atoms on the left is 1, but the number of aluminium atoms Al on the right is 2, so the reaction is clearly unbalanced. Similarly, the number of oxygen atoms on the left is 2, and the number of product atoms on the right is 3, isn't it? So now we need to balance this equation. When we had a look at the steps to balance the equation, the first step was balance the number of atoms of the element which has the maximum number of atoms. The second step was to balance the rest of the atoms. Now which element has the maximum number of atoms? Clearly oxygen. Oxygen has 3 atoms on the right and 2 on the left which is the maximum, isn't it? So first let's balance oxygen atoms. If we look carefully, we can see that if we multiply Al2O3 by 2 and if we multiply O2 on the left by 3, in that case we will have 6 oxygen atoms on the left and 6 oxygen atoms on the right, isn't it? We've multiplied Al2O3 by 2 and O2 by 3. And now we see that oxygen is balanced. However, aluminium is not balanced because there are 4 aluminium atoms on the right but only 1 aluminium atom on the left. So we can multiply Al on the left by 4. When we do that, there are 4 aluminium atoms on the left and right. And of course, there are 6 oxygen atoms on the left and right. And so this reaction is now balanced because each element in the reaction has the same number of atoms on the left and the right hand side. Shall we consider yet another example? Do let's. Al plus C gives Al4C5. Aluminium plus carbon gives aluminium carbide. Now again, this reaction is not balanced. That is because, as you can see, there's only one aluminium atom on the left, but there are four aluminium atoms on the right. There's one carbon atom on the left, but there are five carbon atoms on the right. To balance this equation, we can balance carbon first because carbon has the maximum number of atoms. So step 1 is to balance the number of carbon atoms. We can do that by multiplying C on the left by 5. When we do that, we get this expression. We can similarly balance aluminium by multiplying Al on the left by 4. And when we do that, this is what we get. So 4Al plus 5C gives Al4C5. The number of reactant and product atoms for aluminium is now 4 on both sides and the number of reactant and product atoms for carbon is 5 on both sides. So there we go, we have balanced this equation. Now that we've studied so much about balancing equations and exactly how to consider which atom to balance first and you know then how to draw this table, how to compare the reactant and product atoms. Now that we've seen the entire procedure properly, let's solve some problems. Let's try to balance some more equations in those problems. Here, this problem says, balance the equation Al plus HCl gives AlCl3 plus H2. So is this reaction balanced? Let's take a look. First of all, let's draw this table. In this table, let's see how many reactant atoms of Al are there and how many product atoms of Al are there. As you can see, one Al reactant atom and one Al product atom. Similarly, hydrogen has one atom on the left but two atoms on the right. Chlorine has one atom on the left but three atoms on the right here. Clearly, this equation is unbalanced because the number of atoms of each element on the left are not the same as the number of atoms of each element on the right. Therefore, let's balance this equation. Now to balance this equation, we first have to balance the number of atoms of chlorine because Cl has the maximum number of atoms, 3, isn't it? Now to balance chlorine, let's multiply HCl on the left hand side by 3. When we do that, we have 3 chlorine atoms on the left and 3 chlorine atoms on the right. Now that we've done this, let's balance the number of hydrogen atoms. Now, how will we balance hydrogen? There are only two atoms of hydrogen on the right, but three on the left. If we multiply this 3HCl on the left by 2, we will get 6HCl. And if we multiply H2 on the right by 3, 
we will get 3H2 and we will then have 6 hydrogen atoms on the left and 6 hydrogen atoms on the right. Isn't it? So let's do that. Let's multiply this 3HCl by 2 to get 6HCl and let's multiply H2 on the right by 3 to get 6 hydrogen atoms. So now hydrogen is balanced on the left and the right. But one weird thing has happened. Now that we've multiplied 3HCl by 2, chlorine is imbalanced because now there are 6 chlorine atoms on the left but only 3 chlorine atoms on the right. So to balance chlorine, let us multiply AlCl3 on the right by 2. Then we have 6 chlorine atoms on the left and 6 Cl atoms on the right. So now hydrogen is balanced, 6 and 6 and chlorine is also balanced, 6 and 6. Aluminium however is not balanced because there are two aluminium atoms on the right but only one on the left. So to balance aluminium, let's multiply aluminium on the left by 2. And when we do that, all the three elements are balanced. There are two aluminium atoms on the left and right, six hydrogen atoms on the left and right and six chlorine atoms on the left and right. So there you go. We have balanced this reaction. In general, don't be worried when you're asked to balance any reaction. Simply note, you know, which element has the maximum number of atoms. Then try to balance the number of atoms of that element on both sides by multiplying one of the terms on either side. Then try to balance the other elements one by one. Let's solve yet another problem to further understand, you know, how we balance equations. Balance the equation MnO2 plus HCl gives MnCl2 plus H2O plus Cl2. Mn is the symbol for manganese. So manganese dioxide plus HCl gives manganese chloride plus water plus chlorine. So first of all, we'll do the same thing. We'll check if this equation is already balanced. So here we go. On the left hand side, Mn has one atom and on the right hand side also Mn has one atom. On the left hand side, H has one atom but on the right hand side, H has two atoms. Chlorine has one atom on the left hand side but four atoms on the right hand side and oxygen has two atoms on the left hand side and only one on the right hand side. See two atoms here and one atom here. The point is that this equation is definitely imbalanced. That's because the hydrogen atoms are not the same, the chlorine atoms are not the same, even the oxygen atoms are not the same. So now which element do we balance first? We balance chlorine first because as you can see chlorine has the highest number of atoms. Isn't it? Chlorine has four atoms on this side. So we'll balance chlorine. Now to balance chlorine, we will multiply HCl here by four. Isn't it? After all, chlorine has four atoms on the right hand side. So to get four atoms of chlorine on the left hand side, we'll multiply HCl by four. Isn't it? So that balances chlorine. Now when we multiply, you know, H by four on the left, there are four H atoms on the left, but only two H atoms on the right isn't it? So we have to balance the number of hydrogen atoms also. So we multiply this water molecule on the right by 2. When we do that, there are 4 H atoms on the left and there are 4 H atoms on the right. Isn't it? And miraculously, what we notice is that now that we've balanced chlorine atoms and hydrogen atoms, oxygen and manganese atoms automatically get balanced. See the manganese atoms were the same initially also, one on the left and one on the right. Now after you've multiplied this H2O by 2, you have two oxygen atoms on the right and two oxygen atoms on the left. So the number of oxygen atoms also gets balanced. Here we go. This is the final balance scenario. One atom of Mn on both sides, four atoms of H on both sides, four atoms of chlorine on both sides and two atoms of oxygen on both sides. That's the balanced equation. Again, all that we really did was we considered the element which had the highest number of atoms and we first balanced, you know, the atoms of that element on the left and right hand side. Then we balanced the atoms of the other elements. Let's solve yet another problem to further clear our concepts regarding balancing of equations. Balance the equation FeSO4 gives Fe2O3 plus SO2 plus SO3. Ferrous sulfate gives ferrous oxide plus sulfur dioxide plus sulfur trioxide. 
again back to our first step let's check you know if equation is already balanced iron has one atom on the left but two on the right sulfur has one atom on the left but two on the right and oxygen has four atoms on the left but two on the right so clearly this equation is not balanced to balance this equation let's first try to balance oxygen atoms because as you can see oxygen is the element which has the highest number of atoms isn't it it has eight atoms on the right hand side now to balance oxygen we can multiply FeSO4 on the left by 2 isn't it that's because you know there are eight oxygen atoms on the right and there are only four on the left and four into two is eight so if we you know have two molecules of FeSO4 on the left then there will be 8 atoms of oxygen on the left and 8 atoms of oxygen on the right. So we multiply FeSO4 on the left by 2. Now when we do that, not only do the oxygen atoms get balanced, the sulfur and iron atoms also get balanced. You see, now we have 2 sulfur atoms on the left and 2 on the right here. We have 2 Fe atoms on the left and 2 Fe atoms on the right. So automatically, you know, everything got balanced as soon as we balanced oxygen atoms in this case. So this is our balanced equation. So there you go. That's how, you know, we generally balance equations. Now that you know the basics, you know, try practicing more and more and more equations and soon you'll be a balancing equations expert. Understood? Let's now move on to another concept that is especially important for IIT JE. This concept relates to the masses of the reactants and products. Balancing of a chemical reaction helps us find out the amount of reactant required to make the desired quantity of the product. This is a special concept that we'll talk about now. This concept is essential only for IIT JE. It's not really important for your class 10th exams. You see if there's an equation, say Mg plus O gives MgO. In that case, you know, according to this concept, if we know how many grams of Mg are used, you know, in this reaction, we can automatically calculate, you know, how much oxygen is required and how much MgO is produced. Understood? Similarly, if there is this equation, Zn plus H2SO4 gives ZnSO4 plus H2. In that case, if only, you know, the amount of hydrogen produced is given or if only, you know, the amount of zinc in grams is given, you can automatically calculate the exact mass in grams of H2SO4 used, of ZnSO4 used and of H2 produced. So balancing of a chemical reaction tells us the exact amount of reactant required to make the desired quantity of products. Understood? So, you know, you can be asked a question like to prepare 10 grams of ZnSO4, how much zinc is required? So, we can calculate all that using a chemical equation very, very easily. But how do we calculate all that? That's what we're going to study in this IITJ special concept. Let's understand how to calculate the mass of a reactant or product if any one of the masses of the substances involved is given. Let's understand that by solving a problem. What's the amount of HCl required to make 132 grams of AlCl3? Now we know that this is the equation of preparing AlCl3 by making Al and HCl react. There's no doubt about it. We just balanced this equation a short while ago. Now the question states, what is the amount of HCl required to prepare 132 grams of AlCl3? So we can calculate this by using a balanced chemical equation. You see, what does it actually mean? You know, when we say that 2Al plus 6HCl gives 2AlCl3 plus 3H2, it means that two molecules of Al plus six molecules of HCl give two molecules of AlCl3 plus three molecules of H2, isn't it? Now we already know that the molecular weight of Al is 27 units. We know that the molecular weight of HCl is 36.5 units. We know that the molecular weight of AlCl3 is 133.5 units. Similarly, the molecular weight of hydrogen is clearly 2 units, isn't it? 
Now we know all this already. Now since two molecules react with six molecules to give two molecules and three molecules, we can say that actually, you know, two into 27 atomic mass units of aluminium react with six into 36.5 atomic mass units to give 2 into 133.5 atomic mass units plus 3 into 2 atomic mass units, isn't it? After all, I've simply, you know, written down the molecular weight of each molecule, isn't it? If two molecules are reacting with six molecules of HCl to give two molecules of AlCl3 and three molecules of H2, then clearly, you know, these many atomic mass units of Al are reacting with these many units of HCl to give these many units of AlCl3 and these many units of H2. Isn't it? When you simplify those calculations, you get 54 units of Al reacting with 219 units of HCl to give 267 units of AlCl3 and 6 units of H2. So I've written the masses here in atomic mass units. Isn't it? You've understood what's happening till now. Now if 54 units of Al react with 219 mass units of HCl, that also means that 54 grams of Al react with 219 grams of HCl to give 267 grams of AlCl3 and 6 grams of hydrogen, isn't it? After all, this is also mass, isn't it? And this is also mass. So, you know, we can simply convert atomic mass units into grams. In fact, we can even say that 54 kilograms of Al react with 219 kilograms of HCl to give 267 kilograms of AlCl3 and 6 kilograms of hydrogen. We're just multiplying by a factor to get our units. We can say that 54 pounds of Al react with 219 pounds of HCl to give 267 pounds of AlCl3 and 6 pounds of hydrogen, isn't it? So here we go. This is what we can say. And therefore, we can also say that what we want to calculate is how much HCl is required to form 132 grams of AlCl3, isn't it? Now 267 grams of AlCl3 are formed by 219 grams of HCl. So 132 grams of AlCl3 are formed by 219 divided by 267 into 132 grams of HCl, isn't it? That's simple proportionality. 267 grams are formed by 219 grams of HCl. So 132 grams are formed by 219 by 267 into 132. And that comes out to be 108.3 grams. So 108.3 grams of HCl are required to form 267 grams of AlCl3. Understood? That's our answer. So in general, if you're given an equation and you're asked, you know, how much mass of this reactant is required to react with this much mass of another reactant? Or if you're asked, how much mass of reactant must be used to form this much mass of product? In all those cases, first write down the balanced equation. After writing down the equation, write down the grams of each reactant and each product. You can do that by simply calculating the net atomic mass units of each substance reacting with the other substance, isn't it? So you know, you look at the molecular weight and you multiply the molecular weight by the balancing factor, say 2 into Al becomes 54 because the molecular weight of Al is 27. So you know, you simply calculate the mass in grams of each reactant that will react with the other substance. And then you apply proportionality concepts like you say, this much reactant is used to form this much product. So this much reactant will form how much product? So simple problems like this could be asked to you. Understand? Just balance the equation, write down the masses of each reactant and you know each product and you'll get the answer. This concept is important for IIT JE. There's another concept that's really important for IIT JE. The concept is the mole concept. Again, this is not so important for class 10th exams, but for IIT JE, this is the base. Now, one mole consists of n grams of a substance if n is the molecular weight of a substance. What does this mean? You see, if the molecular weight of salt, NaCl, is 58.5, then one mole of NaCl is 58.5 grams of NaCl. If the molecular weight of Mg is 24, that means that one mole of Mg is 24 grams. 
So if the molecular weight of a substance is n, then one mole of a substance is the same as n grams of that substance. The molecular weight of water for example is 18. So 18 grams of water form one mole of water. Basically, if you express the molecular weight of a substance in grams, that weight of the substance is one mole of the substance. Understood? Now this is not the exact definition of what a mole is and when you you know proceed to higher classes you'll learn an even more precise definition of what a mole is. But for now you can understand that this is what one mole is. Understood? Now there's another fascinating fact related to the mole concept. The mole concept helps us because you know when you write an equation you can actually say that you know two moles of aluminium react with six moles of HCl to give two moles of AlCl3 and three moles of hydrogen. Now this is weird isn't it? Why did I replace the coefficients in this equation by moles? That's because remember I just told you I had said that you know 2 into 27 grams of aluminium react with 6 into 36.5 grams of HCl to give 2 into 133.5 grams of AlCl3 and 3 into 2 grams of hydrogen, isn't it? I had just said a short while ago that, you know, the molecular mass of Al is 27, the molecular mass of HCl is 36.5, that of AlCl3 is 133.5 and that of hydrogen is 2. So I had said that these many grams of aluminium react with these many grams of HCl to give these many grams of AlCl3 and hydrogen. However, 27 grams of aluminium is 1 mole of aluminium, isn't it? 36.5 grams of HCl is 1 mole of HCl and 133.5 grams of AlCl3 is 1 mole of AlCl3 and 2 grams of hydrogen is 1 mole of hydrogen. That is the reason you can say that 2 moles of Al react with 6 moles of HCl to give 2 moles of AlCl3 and 3 moles of hydrogen. So basically you can actually replace the coefficients in the equations by the term moles. Understood? This is again a slightly complicated concept but it's important for IIT JE. Let's now solve some problems to clear our mole concepts. Find the amount of water in 1 mole of H2O. Well, the molecular weight of water is 18. So 1 mole of water contains 18 grams of water. And that's our answer. That was simple wasn't it? This question was simply based on the definition of a mole. Find the amount of water in 1 mole of H2O. 1 mole of H2O has 18 grams of water. This one is slightly tough. The next question. How many moles of HCl will be required to react with 1 mole of MnO2? You see we just wrote down the reaction between you know MnO2 and HCl a short while ago. This was the reaction. We had even balanced it if you remember correctly. MnO2 plus 4HCl gives MnCl2 plus 2H2O plus Cl2. Now we have to find out how many moles of HCl react with 1 mole of MnO2. Now clearly from this equation 1 mole of MnO2 reacts with 4 moles of HCl because the coefficient of HCl in this equation is 4. So that's our answer. 4 moles of HCl react with 1 mole of MnO2 to produce 1 mole of MnCl2, 2 moles of water and 1 mole of chlorine. In the previous question, if 3 moles of HCl are taken, how many grams of MnO2 will be required? Ah, so this gets slightly complicated here. Now the previous question had this equation. If 3 moles of HCl are taken, how many grams of MnO2 will be required? This question is very easy to answer, though it might seem difficult. You see, when there are 4 moles of HCl, 1 mole of MnO2 is required, there's no doubt about it. So when there are 3 moles of HCl, clearly 1 by 4 into 3 moles of MnO2 will be required, that is 3 by 4 moles of MnO2 will be required, isn't it? That's simple proportion. And 3 by 4 moles of MnO2 is 3 by 4 into molecular weight of MnO2, isn't it? So when you multiply the molecular weight of MnO2 by 3 by 4, then the final mass in grams that you get comes out to be 42.75 grams. So 42.75 grams of MnO2 react with 3 moles of HCl. That's our answer. 
So as you can see, you know the mole concept simply involves understanding how many moles of a substance react with how many moles of the other substance and then you can always convert the moles into grams because one mole is the molecular weight of a substance in grams. And now that we've discussed the mole concept, let's move on to the next concept. Concept of chemical notation. You see, until now we were writing reactions and we were balancing reactions, but we missed out on something important. You know, consider this reaction for example, Zn plus copper sulfate gives Zn SO4 plus Cu. In this case, what are the states of the reactants? What reactant is solid? What reactant is liquid? What reactant is in solution? You know, dissolved in solution. Similarly, are there any gases? How do we get to know all that? Similarly, what are the reaction conditions? Are we heating copper sulfate and zinc? You know, are we adding some catalyst? That is, are we adding some extra substance that doesn't react but helps this reaction? So, we need to know all that data too. We can get all that information by using some special symbols in our chemical equations. For example, when zinc reacts with copper sulfate to form zinc sulfate and copper, we represent zinc by writing Zn and then S in brackets. The S in brackets indicates solid. Similarly, we write, you know, Aq next to copper sulfate. The Aq here represents aqueous. This means that copper sulfate is in an aqueous solution. That is, it's dissolved in water. Similarly, we write ZnSO4 aqueous, Aq. This means zinc sulfate is dissolved in water. And we write Cu brackets S. This means that copper is produced in the solid form. So we use the symbols S and aqueous to denote, you know, solid substances and aqueous solutions. Similarly, we use the symbol L if we have to denote a liquid. So for example, if mercury is formed, you know, in a reaction and it's formed in liquid state, we'll write Hg in brackets L. If H2 is formed in a reaction, we'll write H2 in brackets gas, that is G. So S, AQ, L and G are the four symbols that are used to denote the states of the reactants and products. Understood? S for solid, AQ for aqueous solution, L for liquid and G for gas. That definitely, you know, gives us a clearer picture of exactly what is happening. Another symbol we use in our reactions is this one, the delta symbol. This triangular symbol called the delta symbol denotes heating. So if FeSO4 is heated to produce Fe2O3 plus SO2 plus SO3, in that case, you know, this triangle indicates heat is being added to the reaction. Understood? So this is again very, very important, the heating symbol. You must remember it. Here we go. KClO3 solid on heating gives KCl solid and oxygen gas. Understood? Now in this reaction you can see that MnO2 is written below the arrow. Why is that so? This means that you know an MnO2 catalyst is required for this reaction to take place. A catalyst is a substance which helps another reaction but it doesn't itself react. So MnO2, you know, is not involved in this reaction, but the presence of MnO2 helps this reaction to proceed. And that is why MnO2 is called a catalyst. So when certain catalysts are required, they are mentioned like this, you know, below the arrow. Heat is mentioned above the arrow and catalysts are also mentioned near the arrow, sometimes above and sometimes below the arrow. Understood? So these kind of reactions are complete depictions of exactly what is happening because the state of the reactant and products is known, the catalyst is known and you know the heating symbol is also known. So there you go. That was about better chemical notations being used in chemical reactions. The last topic that we are going to now study relates to exothermic and endothermic reactions. Endothermic reactions are basically reactions in which heat must be added to the reactants to produce products. Such reactions are endothermic reactions. Let me give you an example. An amazing example of an endothermic reaction is you know the decomposition of calcium carbonate. Now here, 
you know, I've taken this beaker and I've added some CaCO3 to this beaker. Here, the CaCO3 has settled in the beaker. Now, when I add heat, after some time, calcium carbonate actually decomposes to give calcium oxide and carbon dioxide here. Isn't it? Now, the important fact is that as soon as I stop providing heat by switching off the burner, you can see that the reaction stops. See, the mass of calcium carbonate and the mass of calcium oxide has suddenly become constant. That's because I've stopped supplying heat. Now, if I start supplying heat again, the reaction has begun again. If I stop supplying heat again, as you'll see, the reaction stops. My point here is that, you know, the reaction proceeds only when I supply heat and it does not proceed when I don't supply heat. And therefore, the decomposition of calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide is an endothermic reaction. There are some other reactions in which reactants gives product plus heat. What this means is that, you know, there are many reactions in which heat is finally produced as the reaction takes place. So you don't have to keep supplying heat, you know, for the reaction to occur. The reaction itself produces a lot of heat. Such reactions are called exothermic reactions. So in case of endothermic reactions, you have to keep supplying heat for the reaction to take place. In case of exothermic reactions, you know, once the reaction has started, the reaction itself produces heat. You don't have to supply any heat. Take the burning of coal, for example. I've placed this piece of coal in the beaker here. And now I'm burning it. The interesting fact here is that once the coal starts burning, it keeps burning automatically. See, I've switched off the heat supply, but the coal continues burning by itself. The reaction is taking place. You see, the amount of carbon is getting lesser and carbon dioxide is being produced, but it's happening automatically. Can you see that? No extra heat is required for this reaction to take place. So this reaction is an exothermic reaction. The burning of coal is an exothermic reaction. Understood? Of course, you have to supply the initial heat, you know, to start the reaction. But then you can just rest assured that the reaction will take place by itself. So that's what happens in case of exothermic reactions. They actually produce heat. This concept finally brings us to the end of this chapter related to chemical equations. Hope you enjoyed the chapter. Let's move on to the next one.